sometimes it takes a while to get the hang of adjusted rules. In this case, I'm not talking about the 2016 WFTDA and MRDA rules of flat track roller derby. I'm talking about in 2014, when we started seeing skaters, jammers in particular, getting called for forearms when trying to maneuver around either the inside or outside boundary. You may have noticed that while the call is still being made, it's not happening nearly as often as it was for the first year. Most rules, forearms included, take time for people, even highly experienced ones, to get the hang of it. And this applies to both officials and skaters alike. So as you go through this module and any of the rules, if you're just getting started, know that everyone has a learning curve when things are new, from new officials to championship caliber ones. Before we begin, however, I'd like to give you some fair warning. This presentation is not the official word from the WFTDA or MRDA. I am a level four referee with the WFTDA, but I am not working for them, and this has no official approval from them. I'm just a guy who wants to help out. And like anything that doesn't come with a WFTDA or MRDA seal of approval, take with an appropriate level of salt. In an effort to keep this presentation as correct as possible, I'm including the date that this presentation was recorded. In the event that I need to update the presentation due to something that was clarified or just out and out wrong, this date will change and there will be an update in the change log that's listed with the presentation on refed.com. This presentation was originally recorded on January 17, 2015. Major updates were made on February 24, 2017 for updated rules of flat track roller derby. If you think about roller derby, at its core, it's built around two things. The legs, in order to move around and skate, and the core of the body to block and be blocked upon. And while roller derby is a mentally challenging game, the use of the head as a physical portion of the game is strictly disallowed, as is the arms. You can hit the arms, of course, and you can use arms to whip, but you can't use your arms to block anyone. And if you want to be really simplistic about the rule, there you have it. But as referees, there are subtleties that we need to know about. First and foremost, you need to review the blocking zones diagram from the WFTDA rules. Since this is not a WFTDA presentation, I won't include their copyrighted material. So if you need to, pause the presentation and take a look. Notice that part of the arms is a legal blocking zone from the shoulders to the elbow. This zone is legal and people can block with it. Because that distinction is often missed, it's really easy for referees to incorrectly call blocks with that part of the body as illegal. The impact spectrum for forearms and hand calls has changed from prior rule sets, and it takes much less force to be given a penalty. So it's very important that we be aware of what part of the arm is actually doing the blocking, lest we give an incorrect penalty. We'll get into that a bit more later on. The trick with that blocking zone is that it's also very easy for a legal block to turn illegal, be it by a prolonged block that slides down the blocker's arm into an illegal territory, or a turn of the body that pushes the forearm into play. Another issue that's commonly mistakenly called as a forearm is when the arm is tucked into the body. In this case, you can consider the arms to be part of the body, there's nothing happening that wouldn't have happened had the arms not been tucked in. And again, to show how quickly things can change, the legal absorption of a block can turn illegal by pushing off with those previously tucked in arms. We'll start with what I'm calling the classic impact spectrum. The illegal action causes an opponent to lose relative position, usually by being knocked down, out of bounds, or by forcing her to be passed by the blocker or one of the blocker's teammates. This is your typical push your opponent scenario, possibly a chicken wing. It should be very straightforward to understand. The trick with these calls is determining what caused that loss of position. Was it actually the forearm or hand? 
Or did the arm just follow the opponent out with her? Take a shoulder block. The blocking skater's arm and torso hit her opponent and push her out of bounds. The arm is tucked away on the blocker's body, but as she pulls away from her opponent, her arm stays with the opponent and it looks like she's pushing her opponent as she's skating away. This can be very difficult to differentiate between an actual push where the skater is using her arm to finish off that blocker and ensure she goes out of bounds, or if that arm is just being an example of Newton's first law of motion. Think of it this way. If a skater is trying to play cleanly, she's not putting energy into her arm. And if there's no energy, that arm is going to stay in place, more or less, until the shoulder, which is moving away, forces it back. Also, think about how people block and pick out their targets. More often than not, if a player is performing a shoulder or hip block, she is looking at her target. And once the block has been performed, will turn her attention back to the rest of the track. If her head is turning away at the time of the possible forearm, that's a pretty good indication that while the arm may still be attached, it's not actually doing anything forceful. So how do we tell the difference? Carefully. I can't guarantee you a call-all method, but what I look for is, did the arm move above and beyond its positioning when the initial block occurred? Did the arm jerk up? Was there additional strain? Did it stay rigid after it would have normally flopped back to the side of the body? Ultimately, the rule of thumb of, if you can't tell it, you can't call it, applies. The second impact spectrum is very similar to multiplayer blocks. This is no longer listed in the rules, but it's still major impact, which is, as of the 2016 rules, still penalizable. Like multiplayer blocks, it's not a change of relative position, but the successful impediment of an opponent's mobility. As a matter of fact, you could take a picture of a multiplayer block, remove the link, and still get a penalty, but this time for forearms. It used to be very common for skaters in defensive walls to have their arms out to block opponents, and unless they used it to push an opponent behind themselves, thus losing position, it was a no-impact penalty, and nothing would be called. Starting with the December 2014 rules and continuing to today, it is now a penalty with impact. As far as what amount of impediment is enough to warrant a penalty, the 2016 rules ask us to use our best judgment. If the player blocked suffers no ill effects, then no penalty. But if there is impact, and we don't have to be as strict about impact as we used to, then yes, we can call that penalty. That impact could be the standard impact spectrum, or severely off balance, or cause a sizable change of location, if not position on the track. Or slow the skater down just enough to close what was a wide open hole that would have been used otherwise. Some good rules of thumb would be, would it change that skater's strategy? Would it decrease her effectiveness as a blocker or jammer? Or would it decrease the effectiveness of her teammates? Some of this will depend on the skill level of the skaters. Someone who can't skate a straight line may, if not create a higher burden of proof, at least make it more difficult to actually determine if the action caused her to move or if she did so of her own volition. Something you don't see very often, but does happen occasionally, is the penalty for an skater assisting herself by pushing off or whipping off an opponent, or just pushing an opponent to do the block for her. I've seen this a few times, and most of the time there is an immediate what the heck moment, followed by something ain't right. It's okay to give yourself that time to sort through it. Just don't forget to call the penalty too. Finally, a bit about expulsions. In most expulsion calls or recommendations, remember that it is the attempt, 
not necessarily the result of the action that is the grounds for the expulsion. I've seen an expulsion for someone who was on the floor reaching out and grabbing the opposing jammer to try to drag her down. The jammer got free before going down, but that didn't stop the head ref from expelling the player regardless. I refer you to the glossary, where serious illegal action, physical violence, and extraordinary physical threat to others are all listed. Remember that just because something isn't listed, if it was done with an illegal action and is clearly not roller derby related, then you can consider it as something that may be expellable. I mean, is trying to shove someone to the floor derby related? No, it's not. Before we wrap up, let's go through a few examples. The first one I want to go over is just how little a legal block with the upper arm can turn into an illegal one. In this example, there's no actual change in how the arm is bent, just where the arm is resting upon the opponent. So the upper arm legal blocking zone now adds in the illegal forearm blocking zone. Similarly, someone blocking with their arms out is completely legal until those arms start impairing the mobility of their opponent. In this case, once the arms start closing around, the white blocker has potentially impeded the mobility of the black blocker. And should that black blocker choose to test that impediment, there should be a penalty if it was in any way successful. Remember, if the black blocker in this example doesn't challenge those extended arms, there can be no penalty. This next example is pretty similar to the last one in that the arms need to be challenged in order for there to be a penalty. This example should also ring some bells if you're familiar with multiplayer blocks. This isn't a multiplayer block as there is no link, but the impact spectrum for holding someone back with a forearm is essentially the same as a multiplayer block. If that white skater is able to blow past the forearms like they weren't there, there is no penalty to issue. Likewise, with multiplayer blocks, there is no penalty for positionally blocking with a forearm. There must be contact. In this example, I'm going to ask for a little bit of imagination. The orange blocker dead center, the one with a black helmet, may be using her forearms to push her way through the pack. I'm going to say may because it's been awfully hard to find pictures of someone actually doing that. It's frequently called swimming. But for the example's sake, let's say she used her forearms to help clear space to help her get through the pack. The space made it easier for her to get where she wanted to go and is therefore a penalty. In this example, we have a relative position forearm. In this case, the black blocker isn't gaining any position over her opponents but the forearm opened up more than enough space for her teammate to get through and take position on the white skaters. Back in the introduction to this module, I talked about jammers going to the inside or outside line and getting called for a forearm. At the time, the measure of if a skater used their forearm to help them get past another skater was called materially aiding. The long way of describing it was did the use of the forearms aid the skater in such a way as that they might not have gotten past the opponent otherwise? With the 2016 rules release, this really doesn't change, except now we don't have to create a new definition, but simply ask if those forearms propelled the other skater enough to cause impact. This is actually an easy question to ask, but harder to answer, because often the skater is already moving at a decent clip and may just be using the hands to track her opponents, which is legal. It means we have to determine if the skater advanced by her own momentum or because of the illegal use of that forearm. A good rule of thumb is to see if the skater is actively using her feet to propel herself, or are the feet stationary? The idea is that if the feet are moving, then the skater is propelling herself, but if they're not, it's the arms of that skater that is doing the propulsion. I can think of instances where that rule of thumb might be incorrect, 
but it does give you a pretty good idea of what to do in most instances. But to follow this aid, it means you have to observe the skater's entire body, not just the portion doing the potentially illegal action. If you focus on just the forearms in this situation, you've missed half of the information necessary for a correct call. Forearm and hand calls aren't the most plentiful calls in the roller derby world. But there is an emphasis that the game shouldn't involve blocking with the hands because of the unfair amount of leverage they give when used against opponents. Like all presentations here, this is not an end-all be-all, but merely a beginning. But hopefully it does give you a good foundation on which to start on. I'd like to thank the following photographers for permission to use their photos. Quick and Derby, Preflash Gordon, and Neil Gunner. I'd like to thank the Minnesota Roller Girls for letting me use their practice space for my post photos, and Rhea Volt, Bernasty, Hannah Shot First, and Diamond Ruff for volunteering to help me out in those example shots. If you found this presentation helpful, or think it or other presentations at refed.com might be helpful to others, please share this site. But please do not modify it or send it out without appropriate credit for its production. This presentation is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License.